Hi, everyone. Now we are on the second um, lecture on a skeleton. We're going to start with the axial skeleton. So we need to begin by saying, well, what do we mean by the axial skeleton? So when we look at it, the axial skeleton is going to include everything that's on the main axis of you. So the main middle part of your body. It'll include the skull, the thoracic cavity, and then the vertebral column in the back. Okay, so I'm gonna break it up into three pieces. We're gonna talk about the skull first, then we'll talk about the vertebral column, and then we'll talk about the thoracic cage. Okay, so when we look at it, the skull, here's the skull. There's two kind of general functional, general functional bones, sets of bones. The first are the cranial bones, and the cranial bones are these top ones here, and they're called that because they, they enclose and protect the brain, right? So they, they create the cranium where the brain is inside of it. And one thing that I'd like you to notice is when we look inside of the skull, it has a lot of some deep depressions in there. Remember that the word for depression is a fossa, okay? So a depression is a fossa. So when we look at it here, the front one is called the anterior cranial fossa. The anterior cranial fossa, anterior means front, cranial as in cranium as in the, you know, encloses the brain, and the depression means fossa. Okay, that is going to correspond to where you're going to find the frontal lobe of the brain. And then this one right here in the middle, that will be the middle, cranial fossa. Please note that I did not say mean medial. I said middle. Okay, so not medial, middle. The mi middle cranial fossa, that is where the temporal lobe is going to stick out there. And if you look at it from the side, you see this right here, that's the temporal lobe. And so the middle cranial fossa is going to kind of support that structure there. And in the back, you have the posterior cranial fossa. That would be this deep depression back here. And that's where you're going to find, oops, wrong direction. That's where you're going to find this structure, which is called the cerebellum. Okay, so for this point, don't focus on the structures of the brain. Focus on the fact that you have um, these structures, these depressions in the cranium to support the brain. And to really kind of look at that with a little bit more detail, let me point to one more structure of the brain, and that's called the pituitary. Okay, so the pituitary is a gland that sticks out from the brain. And so you need a protection for that to, to kind of cup that structure. And so when we look inside here, we have the structure that looks like, that I you know, generally call the Turkish saddle. Do you remember what that one was called? Hopefully by this point, you're starting to look through and learn the structures of the skull for lab. Okay, so I'm gonna expect as I go through this lecture that you have seen some of these words before. This structure right here is called the cella trisica. Cella trisica. And the function of that cella trisica is to cup and support the pituitary gland. Okay, so we've got all of these kind of depressions and structures in here to support the structures of the brain. Moving on. Okay, so for this, when we look inside here, the other thing I'd hope you notice is, yes, there's quite a lot of holes, and the general term for a hole is a foramen, and if it's multiple holes, it's foramina. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of foramina in the in the skull, and there's two reasons for that. And one of them is because that's how the cranial nerves that are part of the brain coming off of the brain are going to pass, right? So they need to get to their, where they're going to go, and the way that they can get through it is by going through one of these holes. So I don't actually want to go through all of those little ho holes and all of the cranial nerves, but I do want to highlight it a little, uh, a couple things. Okay, so let's, let's start with the optic nerve. So the second cranial nerve is the optic nerve. Now don't spend too much time learning the names of the cranial nerves yet. We'll come back to that when we get to the nervous system. But for now, I'd like you to notice that here is the optic nerve. Just based on the name, what do you think it does? What kind of information do you think it carries? 
yeah, the optic nerve carries sight information, so vision information from the eye to the brain, right? So it's got to pass through the skull in order to get to the brain. And so based on your hopeful study, what I'm hoping you're doing in lab, studying the different uh, holes of the, of the skull, what bone feature do you think the optic nerve passes through? Okay, so what does it pass through? The answer is the optic canal, okay? So it's called the optic canal because the optic nerve passes through it. And instead of being just a simple hole, it's more of like a tube-like hole. And so it's a canal instead of a foramen, okay? So there's, when you're looking at these holes, make sure that you look at them in multiple orientations. So for the optic canal, you can find it if we go to the very front, so here's the face, so this would be the anterior side here. This is the sphenoid bone. And on the sphenoid bone, we're gonna have some deep holes. That would be the optic canal. And you can also see the optic canal, if you look deep back into the eye socket, see that super round hole in there? That is going to be the optic canal that carries that allows the optic nerve to pass through the skull and back into the brain. Okay. So that's the optic canal. We also have some of these holes to allow blood vessels to pass through. Okay, so let me go to highlight one of them. So when you're looking at the bottom of the skull, here, this big hole right here that's called the foramen magnum that carries the spinal cord. If you look anterior to that, you're going to see, it's a little hard to show you, you're going to see a kidney bean hole. Okay, so what, let's look at what that's for. So here is some blood vessels, so the heart would be down here. This blue one right here, this is called the internal jugular vein, internal jugular vein, and its job is to drain the blood from the head back down into the heart. And so it's got to pass through the skull. Where do you think it passes through? Okay, so this kidney bean hole right there, that is called the jugular foramen. Okay, so you've got your skull right here, your, sorry, your foramen magnum right there, anterior to that, and a, and a little bit lateral. That is going to be that is going to be the jugular, the jugular foramen. And it's, and it's called that because the, jug, the internal jugular vein is gonna pass through that hole right there. Now, if you go just anterior to that, you're going to see a canal-like hole, okay? A tube-like hole, like a tunneling going through. What do you think that one's called? And hint, it's related to blood vessels. Okay, so let's look back at this blood vessel right here. So this blue one is called the internal jugular vein. It's gonna pass through the jugular foramen. Right next to it is the common carotid artery. And the common carotid artery, what it does is brings blood to the head, okay? So it also needs to pass through the skull. So what do you think it passes through? It's going to pass through this little hole right here. And again, it's more of a canal. So it's going to be called the carotid canal. Okay, so make sure that you look through it. Um, one thing to notice is that some models, my model, for example, it doesn't really go all the way through. They just sort of show it making a tunnel tour inside. But that would be the one just anterior to the jugular foramen, that little canal like right there. Okay, so those are some foramen or canals that are associated with allowing blood vessels to pass through. The, this one right here, so we already named this a couple of times. Do you remember what that one was called? It's the biggest one, the big one, the big hole. That is the foramen or foramen, again, how you pronounce it is up to you, foramen magnum. And the reason it's so big is because there's a structure that goes through it. That is the spinal cord. Okay, so the spinal cord will come right out through there and then run down the hole that's created by the um, vertebrae stacked together. Okay, so now let's look at some structures for muscle attachments. 
Okay, so generally speaking, ones that are involved in muscle attachments tend to be kind of rough, but not, but not every time. So let's start with this one right here. Do you happen to remember what this one here? It's the one that's right behind your ear bone, ear bone, your ear, so that, that kind of mound of muscle, mound of bone, I meant to say. This one here, this is called the mastoid process. And the mastoid process is going to connect to the sternocleidomastoid, which is the muscle that's used to turn your head. Okay, that's a sternocleidomastoid muscle right there. Okay, so it's going to attach to the mastoid right there, and that's what allows you to turn your head. There's one other one that I wanted to point out. Okay, so if we have, while we're here, this one here is the mastoid process because it's connected to the sternocleidomastoid, which is named based on the, its origin insertion. This one right here, this super sharp one here, that's called the styloid process. And the styloid process is also used for muscle attachments. Okay, so we'll get to that more when we get to the muscle, the, this muscular system. But for now, I'd like you to know that this is also used for muscle attachments. Okay, so let's look at some of the bone features that are involved with sensory information. We've already seen one. Okay, there's one because the optic canal is related to vision because it carries, because the optic nerve carries vision information. But let's look at ones for hearing. So when we look at the skull, okay, here is a very deep, deep canal. Do you remember the term for a deep canal? It starts with an M. It's a meatus. So this hole, this canal right here, that's your ear hole, right? You're right there, your ear hole right there. That is the external acoustic meatus. So external because it's on the outside, acoustic because it's related to hearing, meatus because it's a deep canal-like structure, okay? so. That is on the outside. I so that would be your your ear hole, your ear canal right there. Okay. There's also another one that's related to it. If you look inside, okay. So this right here, this is the temporal bone, and the temporal bone has a mountain range-like structure inside of it. That's what I call it. It just looks like a mountain to me. Okay. So when you look at that mountainous part, that's called the petrous part. The petrous part. Okay, so you have the petrous part, which is the mountain, and you have the squamous. Do you remember what squamous means? Flat. The squamous part is the flat part of the temporal bone. Okay, but looking back at the petrous part, when you look at the petrous part, you're going to notice if you look on the posterior side of the petrous part, you're going to notice a canal that goes towards the ear. That canal that goes towards the ear, that is going to be the internal acoustic meatus. Now, please note that it's really important when you notice that it, the hole, it's a canal, so it's deep, that's why it's a meatus, and it's going to be oriented towards the hole. Okay, so posterior, backside of the mountain, internal acoustic meatus. On the anterior side of the mountain, is gonna be the carotid canal. Okay, oh, I should have showed you this picture, sorry. Okay, so there's, there's your jugular vein right there. J sorry, jugular foramen. This right here on the inside, so on the posterior side of the petrous part, on the back side of the mountain, that's going to be your internal acoustic meatus. Okay, so let's look at smell. So where do you think smell is gonna happen, right? It's gonna be in the nose, okay? So do what, what bone is really, really deep in behind the nose? So remember that this right here, these little thin plates, those are the nasal bones, but the nasal bones are very superficial. They only lie on the top. Little br they just create the bridge of your nose. If you're talking about being deep in there, everything kind of really deep 
in back, far back in your nose, those are all going to be involved on coming off of the ethmoid bone. And when you look at the ethmoid bone, if you look inside, so this, would, this little projection here, this would be right above the roof of your nasal cavity, okay? So that would be where your nasal cavity, if we were to follow it down into it. Th that is part of the ethmoid bone. And so the little thing that sticks up like this, coming up out of it, that would be called the Christigalli, Christigalli, the coxcomb, but surrounding it is going to have be some texture. See the texture surround, so the Christigalli here, and the texture surrounding it is you have a flat plate. That's called the cribriform plate. So Christigalli up, cribriform plate, horizontal, like a plate, you know, like a plate. <laughs> now, what is the name, so the, what bone would those be on? Those would all be on the ethmoid bone. So Christigalli up, cribriform plate, horizontal, perpendicular to that. And what was the name of those little tiny holes? So those little tiny holes, those are the olfactory foramina. Remember, foramina is just the plural form of foramen. And the olfactory foramina allow nerve fibers from the olfactory nerves to go through them so that they can synapse with the structure here and take scent information, so smelling information to the brain. Okay, so you've got a whole bunch of bone features associated with the scent of smell. We have the cribriform plate, which is the plate that they pass through, and we have the olfactory foramina, which are the specific, which are the holes in the cribriform plate that the nerve fibers pass through. Okay, and all of those would be on the ethmoid bone. So when you're looking through here, this part right here and the cribriform plate that surrounds it, this would be the ethmoid bone. What bone would the rest of it be? The rest of it would be the frontal bone, frontal bone. Okay, so think of it like a little island floating in the frontal bone. Okay, let's talk about sutures. Okay, so hopefully you've already seen the, the video where we talked about um, bone growth and development. Okay, so we should hopefully you notice that the, the flat bones of the skull, those are going to be formed through a special type, a special process called intramembraneous ossification, which just means that you're growing bone from a membrane instead of from hyaline cartilage, and the membrane would be made of mesenchyme. But anyways, let's come back together. So as they, as the bones grow, they kind of knit together. And when, and this, when they grow together, they make this, this jagged line between them. So the jagged line between all of the cranial bones, those are going to be called sutures. Okay, so they all have their names. So for example, this one right here, this is called the sagittal suture. And it's called that because it's right dab smack along the sagittal plane. Okay, so that's the sagittal suture right there. We also have the coronal suture right here because corona is another word for frontal plane. Okay, so we have a bunch of cranial, cranial knitting together. Those are all the sutures here. Okay, this is the squamous suture there. Okay, so what I would like you to do is go ahead and see if you can name at least one bone feature related to each of these things. And there's multiple ones, so there's multiple correct answers. Okay. On to some facial bones. I think I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video and make a separate one for the facial bones.